Welcome to the Dead Horse Podcast. Yes, I'm back this week, and today we're going to talk about nothing in particular. With me are Vivek. Hey, guys. And Arvind. Hello. So, what have you guys been playing recently? I've been playing this small indie game called Saturday Morning RPG. It's uh-huh. it's basically like pop culture references the game. Not really very <laughs> clever with them or anything, but yeah, the battle system is kind of oh, nice. So, you mean Borderlands 2? Oh. Well, I mean, Borderlands 2, yeah, I mean, Borderlands 2, like, I guess it's, I mean, it, 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 Borderlands 2 is practically, like, has no references compared to this game. Because, like, this yes. game starts, like, the first line is a pop culture reference and all the item descriptions are pop culture references. So, like, this game, like, if you remove the pop culture from it, nothing remains. Uh, you're saying that the combat is interesting. Like Borderlands 2. Yeah, so... So, okay, so the combat is like, uh, it's uh, turn-based in, in how like old Final Fantasy games used to work. So they okay. have their turn, you have your turn. Uh, and uh, instead of like, you have a regular attack and you have a multiplier. So mu- the multiplier simply is like, if your multiplier is at 5, then whatever attack you do at that time does 5 times as much as much damage. So you can either like do lots of weak attacks at once or charge your multiplier. It takes one turn and some mana. So that's right. very interesting because uh, like you, it's not like you unlock an attack and uh, immediately like you start using it everywhere and on your turn and everything. But instead like longer attacks take more uh, turns to charge. So the enemy might get two turns if the attack is really like slow. So. Right. And and the idea is that instead of like you have a regular attack, but you can also have like five different uh, special attacks, which range from all sorts of uh, weird things. Like there is one attack which is called laser disc, where you throw a la- laser disc at an enemy. So like it has a mini game attached to it, and like it's very accurate, but it has some uh, drawbacks. So the com- the combat system is fairly interesting. And it uses the, the the pop culture references in a funny manner. So like the laser disc attack has some peculiarities, which like it's very hard to describe. Like, but once you play it, you'll know the like w- what they're referencing. And it's some other stuff like that. Uh, the dialogue is very cringeworthy, and the story is like it's the story is so cliche that I'm disappointed because like <laughs> with a parody RPG, you have the chance to actually like lampoon a story but in, but instead what these uh, like developers are doing is just follow the same story but instead like everyone just spouts pop culture references so like your hero is called marty and he has a hoverboard board oh, so, oh so yeah like very obscure reference there so <laughs> so yeah it's stuff hey, like that which maybe, may, yeah maybe in doing that what they're satirizing is our games are basically uh, treading on old pop culture, pop culture references of yore to kind of, uh, you know, I'm using it as shorthand. So they're doing the same thing, but kind of being self-aware about it or you don't feel that it's self-aware at all? No, I don't think, because, like, I don't see that level of, like, subver- like subverting it anywhere. It's just, it go- it's going through the motions. Like, the first chapter, it has five chapters, right? Or five episodes, as it says. So the first episode is about how... Uh, Doctor Doom or something like, like one one letter is different, but he's basically Doctor Doom. He steals Marty's girlfriend, and like you rescue her, and that's the end of the first episode. So I mean, at no point was anything subverted. It's even he even literally like says some lines from Mario or something like, or some other like five hundred games with damsel of distress plots. So mm-hmm. it, it doesn't really subvert anything. It just like goes through the same motions, and. Yeah, like it's so the pl- but it is called Saturday morning RPG. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I think I think they just wanted to do something that was like that crazy and more time bossy types. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it sounds like it sounds interesting. Like the combat is interesting anyway from the way you're yeah. describing it. Uh, so yeah, 
So mechanically a good game, they just didn't figure out the wrapper. They didn't just they didn't exploit the potential of the wrapper they had for it. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, uh, yeah, it's yeah. I guess like because I like some parts of the game, I kind of like feel disappointed because other parts are not as good. But yeah, overall, like I think I got it for like a dollar in some bundle. So I have got my money's worth and more. So yeah, I'm not like sad, but just like it could have been so much better. Oh wow! I can feel sorry for games when all their worth is one dollar. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, uh, yeah, Vivek. What have you been playing? Playing Dark Souls. <laughs> The, so the second so, one or the first one? Do you, do you yeah. have a kill counter? Like for how many times you've died so far? I've not looked, man. Come on, it's probably shameful at this point. I have died because I've slipped and fall. I'll tell you this: I have slipped and fallen to my death at least seven times. Ah. Uh. So from that, you can take a guess how many times I've died fighting. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, like to me, it doesn't like seem that abnormal. I mean, seven. Like I remember that glass level in Dark Souls one. I died like five hundred times by slipping and falling there. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, like seven is practically like, you know, MLG levels of like competence compared to like like how I played Dark Souls. Yeah, you say that now. Like I am not that far into it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <coughs> The, like I mean, I like the thing that about Dark Souls games that I love that this one has retained is just the feeling of exploration. And when you turn a corner, you have no fucking clue what's going to be there. And more often than not, whatever is there is going to kill you. Uh, it's it's terrifying at times. Like I mean, uh, by more often than not, I mean like every single time. Like would be more <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> Pretty much. One of the worst yeah. things that has happened to me so far is running into this place where. There's kind of a, a pretty hard, uh, like a a, a, ca- a character that is not a boss, but he's kind of a little bit hard to kill. And uh, on a ledge uh, uh, above, you see uh, two guys who have bombs in their hands, and they keep throwing bombs. Mm-hmm. And it so happens that there's a, like a cluster of barrels next to this guy that that explode. Mm-hmm. So these guys throw down a bomb, and the like it explodes, <laughs> and uh, this guy is down to like a sliver of his health. And I'm like, yay! And even I've lost health, but I'm not nearly as bad as this guy. So I kill him, and uh, and I run through a, a corridor, and like I'm I'm stoked because you know I've gotten through this area. It was the first time I got through that area. I got through a lot more later on. I got I got through this area. I turn a corner and I see two guards. All right, I start fighting them, and I, I kill them both pretty quickly. It doesn't take too long. And then I turn around and like there's this amazing, uh, like just the the times in this game when you just look at an amazing vista uh, are just, just phenomenal. So like I look up and there is a statue of uh, of a guy with a like you know it's, it's this huge figure and his sword is just uh, leaning down to where I'm standing and I, like I can run up the sword. I can see that I can run up the sword. And at the tip of the hilt of of this uh, uh, of this sword. Is uh, is like a fucking this huge fucking knight with a lance just waiting for me. Oh. Uh, and so I'm like, you know what? Let's do this knight. And I, like, I take out my sword. I take a potion. Like I'm charged. I start running, and uh, I slip and fall <laughs> to my death. Wow. Dark Souls too, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Oh, dark stories! Dark soul stories are just the best. I have a yeah. friend who was playing recently, and he's been like, you know, he's become so twitchy thanks to it that he turned a corner, and he just saw something move and just started hacking at it, and turned out that it was an NPC that he could have, you know, talked to, and now the NPC just ran away and he starts swearing at him. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's uh. That is not a good situation. Sometimes those NPCs can sell you health potions and shit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, they can sell if they can sell you estes like if they can sell you shards. Well, they very rarely do, but some of them can sell you shards for an SD, estes flask, a flask, which is the best thing in the fucking world. Uh, like uh, I don't know if you like Arvind has played Dark Souls, right? Uh, uh yeah, I played the first one, not the second one. 
So the a big difference between the two games I went is in this game after a certain number of uh, times you killed something. Yeah, yeah. The, I... the area becomes empty and like. If people think it's a good thing it is not a good thing uh in the old game if you fucked up a lot there was still a chance for you to keep grinding so that yeah. you could collect visit number of souls and keep leveling up somehow right yeah you can't do that anymore like you kill something 10 or 15 times it's gone and if you haven't utilized those 10 or 15 times properly and you haven't collected souls properly your like your friggin screwed your level is going to get capped very quickly and getting through the bosses is going to be next to impossible yeah no i yeah dark souls was actually pretty challenging from uh, like a, i guess from a like minor pers- micro perspective but from the macro perspective it was very forgiving because like everything used to reset you had a lot of chance to grind easy areas and like just level up get souls so like now what's happened because of the way they've designed the game is i find that i tactically i i leave certain areas like they, you can bypass areas if you don't want to explore them so if i've killed something in an area two or three times and it seems like you know this is a good grind this mm-hmm. cycle if i can get it done i can get maybe 2 3000 souls i'll find that i will leave those areas and try and move ahead and do some exploring before i come back to them to level up And, and get the get souls out of them before I I, I go ahead. Mm-hmm. So like I'll go, I'll do some exploring, I'll scope out an area which I think is dangerous, and then I'll come back, I'll grind through an area, get three thousand souls, level up, and then go further into the exploration area. Uh, I find that that has become a pattern that I try and repeat. I don't like I don't know if it's the the right way to play the play the game, but it's how I'm kind of playing it now. <laughs> but yeah. just it's insane the combat is still fantastic uh i am like it's so twitchy and you just have to be you have to be ready to the correct pixel like you know you can't press the attack button too many times or uh, it's a good chance that you will die yeah i enjoy it it's a fun game yeah i mean i i don't know enough i like, i guess i'll play it eventually But yeah, like Souls you, games are just such like a such a time investment that you can. You of, beat Dark Souls one. Uh yeah, I think like I don't remember like I, I got to the part where I chose the other serpent, the one who was in the empty room. But but I, then I, I think like I did not like kindle the the final flame and saw the ending okay. because like there was this one bo- boss fight where I just like sort of just like my interest like. it was at that point that like the challenge was too much for my interest to continue so i just googled dark souls ending and watched it on youtube <laughs> all right hmm. so uh, but i uh, but i think yeah, i got pretty close to the end yeah that's good that's better than i did i never got even remotely close to the ending uh i haven't even played it so you know good on you <laughs> But uh, have, okay, like uh, for a change of pace, have uh, either you guys played uh, Monument Valley? Yeah, I've I've finished it. Yeah. All right. So I love that game. I thought it was a nice little contained experience. Ooh, I love the level design. I thought that was really nicely done. Now, I need to ask you guys, what is Monument Valley? Uh, it is uh. It's, okay, it's so uh, have you seen those? Uh, have you seen those uh, images where uh, they are pro- are two D images? So they play with your sense of perspective, like a it's staircase yeah, that sure. like you can that you can that's an infinite staircase. You know how it works? Vivek, okay, yeah, Vivek, yeah. it's very so, Escher like. Yeah, that's oh, okay. the word. Yeah, okay. MC Escher. Yeah, I get what you're talking about. Yeah, okay, but like you can manipulate the levels a bit. so like you can twist certain levels you can view each level from four different perspectives uh four four uh-huh. different angles like it's the it's an isometric perspective <laughs> but from four different angles so it's just like, like yeah it's like if you've played fez it's basically an isometric fez all right yeah that sounds cool yeah 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 no it's it pretty good like really the nice. the visual and the sounds are pretty cool and it's hard to it's a platforming game it is it is a traversal game what is it 
it's a so, puzzle game i guess though i mean like the puzzles like the kind of your motivation comes from uh, like just for wanting to see what comes next as opposed to like i have to solve this tricky puzzle because mostly they like they are pretty straightforward which which like in my opinion is a great design achievement because like escher geometry in like in itself is pretty confusing but like they huh. managed to like make it pretty the rules pretty uh, obvious so yeah, you never like really you understand are understand how it yeah. works I, i agree that, that that's the, the way they've handled that is brilliant is that never once as a player are you going you know oh this doesn't make sense but you're you know they managed to get you to think in that way kind of like how portal kind of gets you to start thinking with you know uh you know using portals thinking and momentum with portals, and, yeah. yeah like they, they they ease you into it and then start giving you challenges that really make you go hey i figured this out I, you know i feel good about it and that they they do an amazingly good job with that and uh you know now that we mentioned portal the, the structure is pretty similar in the sense that you know they ease you in give you some challenges introduce some new stuff uh they even have a companion uh, cute moment um and yeah. it, it like it ends on a really nice note like you know the last few levels really ramp it up and you you know you enjoy it and you, you take moment a moment to like you know pause and be like huh this is how they did it so yeah yeah it's so a game, game that uh, that like portal doesn't outstay its welcome it's yeah. it's about like 2 or 3 hours long and and like every moment in it is like you are always like thinking oh my god what's going to happen next or like oh my god this is so beautiful or oh my god the sound like the music is so awesome so it's like a it's a concentrated dose of goodness instead of like they could have easily spread this thinner like but they didn't and like i respect this game a lot for that they do what they do really well in a really really short span of time yeah. well, Three hours is good. It's like for a finite experience, it's not uh, short anymore. I would not say it's short. Yeah, and it's polished really well. Like, yeah. I mean, I would take that like any day over like if they had some kind of like you know coins or energy system in it and like oh, you uh, had to I wait or something. Yeah. I yeah. wonder why you bring up coins and energy systems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just I mean, an obscure example. Uh, uh, no, I was actually thinking of like Dungeon Keeper and like how that kind of ruined. the whole yeah. gameplay <laughs> the, with the energy meter thing so yeah i mean and i know like game game designers in this day and age are capable of like shoehorning energy meters and microtransactions into anything like what's what what are they selling it for uh, i don't know I it's think, like 2 dollars or something no, like i think it's about 4 or 5 yeah some a little bit more than 2 yeah so whatever i paid like i don't regret any bit that's good uh so like what is what was the most memorable moment for you guys in that game uh i don't know like but i guess like i don't really remember any one particular moment like i remember that one where uh, you start off at a rock kind of thing and like you pick up a flower and then slowly like the water keeps on draining lower and lower i like that level a lot because like really like when a whole game is kind of like filled with like the art is absolutely gorgeous throughout the music is absolutely like awesome to listen to and yeah i mean the puzzles like puzzles are probably the weakest compared to like the the visuals and stuff but they are still pretty great so yeah i mean i think it's pretty i don't remember any one particular moment i mean there are lots like there's uh that what they just said the googly eyes yellow thing yeah that the companion cube basically from the cool. all right anything else like you guys want to talk about with respect to monument valley No, I think that's it. Like, uh, just in general, it's a game that's worth playing. It's just very, very well done, and uh, that's about it, really. Like, I-, I thought it was amazing. So sounds good. What else is uh, What else is new? Has anything interesting happened apart from Mythic, which is very depressive? Yeah, it's kind of depressing that all those people are now out on the street looking for a gig, yeah. and it sucks that like a studio which kind of set the bar. uh with uh, MMOs especially like they made one of the most iconic MMOs of this gener- of the last generation which is Dark Age of Camelot yes. has to go out on such a like a low note like yeah, with Keeper. with Dungeon Keeper yeah like how, how, you, you want to ask how did that happen how they go from Age of Camelot to 
Dungeon Keeper mobile, but then yeah. you kind of know, and you're just like, damn. It's just, uh, yeah, the industry changed in a big way. This last generation, MMOs kind of went out of vogue in a huge way. Yeah. And uh, it, it became harder and harder to... Uh, <laughs> it just became too uh, too hard to sustain that market, right? Yeah. Uh, like, Plus, Age of Camelot had a very core and very niche audience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they did a good job with Warhammer Online. Some of the features in that game We're are still... Are kind of mandatory now, especially like local uh, group quests locally and stuff like that have become mandatory in all MMOs. Yeah. They've done some cool stuff for sure. Even Warhammer Online is, a, is an interesting game, if nothing else. Yeah. It's just that uh, they never they never tried to go just like completely, you know, they never tried to go completely out the box again. And I think that might have hurt them in the long run. But anyway, like it really sucks. They're they're a great studio, and it sucks that they. Uh, but yeah, it sucks. It's just it's shitty news. It is. It, it's it's as depressing as a few days ago when they released uh, those images of uh, THQ's uh, abandoned office, oh. and that's just yeah, like that, that was uh, that was sad. Yeah, like, and I I was a huge THQ fan. I'm like, yeah, these guys are awesome, and then they shut down, and now they show me pictures of an abandoned office. I mean, it's like, thanks guys, you know, I need something else to be, you know, just bummed out about. Yeah, it was pretty depressing to see that office with just trophies on the wall and. Uh... Yeah. So let's talk about something more upbeat for a change then. <laughs> let's yeah, let us let's let's do that. Let's talk about something more upbeat. Uh, are, have you been following the vanishing of Ethan Carter? Uh, no, I haven't at all. Actually, like I don't. All right. I know that it exists. I know that it like I I remember the trailer. And it looked very, you know, it looked very, very story focused to me. So I, I was, immediately I was just like, yeah, okay, and moved on. So I haven't seen anything since the first one. So it is a like it is an adventure game uh, being made by like it's a first person adventure game being made by uh, uh, the a team called the Astronauts, and the uh, the gimmick is that. The, the hero can see the last 30 seconds of someone's life. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So, like, that is essentially the core of The Vanishing of Ethan Carter. Uh, the hero is a guy called Paul Prospero. Anyway, so, like, my point is, I, like, I'm not even talking about that game. Uh, the developer of that game is a guy called Adrian... Uh, I can't pronounce his last name. C-H-M-I-E-L-A-R-Z. L-A-R-Z. Uh, Camilar's... Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it at all. I suck at pronouncing that last name. His, his first name is Adrian, and he's the head. He's the lead designer of that studio. And he's been, like, a pretty uh, exceptional in terms of someone who is in the game industry, that he's been very vocal about his opinions about big-budget games. Mm-hmm. And he's very vocal about his opinion about trends in the game industry. And recently, he wrote an article talking about, like, you know, how $60 is, is way too much for, uh, uh, like, way too much, uh, way too high a price point for games. Uh, yeah. You know, and like I, f- I found it a pretty interesting article, and I thought I was thinking, you know, about what your thoughts are regarding game price points and what you think would be an ideal price point uh, for this generation. Mm. Well, you know, I hate to sound kind of like a cop out, but you know, it does depend on the game. But if we're talking AAA, you know, uh, I don't know. It's always been sixty dollars, and like personally, I'm fine with that. Like, yeah, okay, it's a little expensive, especially when you do like the dollar to rupee conversion you're just like god damn but um i think that since it's always been that i'm surprised it didn't go up but then again i what would what would happen if it went up people wouldn't stop you know buying it or it'd been much harder to like you know really get something out that was mass uh that had as many sales as they do today um, I don't know, uh, like, you reduce the price and you're suddenly devaluing yourself. And yet, if you don't, people are going to, like, you know, have certain expectations as well. It, it's a catch-22, and, and it goes for indie games as well. Like, uh, yeah. you know, uh, I'm pretty sure Arvin has this issue where it's like, you know, uh, how much do I price it at where it's low yeah. enough for people to try it out, but not so low that I feel like I'm making a loss. Uh, yeah, like this was this is an issue like I had a lot with like two of my games before like uh, so if my first game was pretty much like 
it was very rough and i and i wasn't very experienced so like i was prepared to make whatever i wanted with it so i so i charged it at like uh, like 299 which at that point was very low it was like yeah, uh, f- yeah. so and then the next game was a bit more polished but i guess i wasn't still very confident so i was like okay 5 dollars but then like it turns out that right now uh, where like where like i feel I, i'm getting better as a game maker like the market's expectations are d- going towards lower prices and the problem is that uh, not just lower prices but that your income doesn't actually like most of your income happens when your game is 75% off <laughs> so it's 75% off that low price so that point you are making like 10 20 cents of a copy yeah can we now extrapolate from this the jeff bogel article where he says that uh, Doom is coming and Steam will die because too many people are going to be on it, Erwin. <laughs> uh, I don't think well, I, Steam yeah, would die. I think, I think like... there is a like a fundamental uh, like misconception here. Like the problem is that this is an entertainment business. So by by its very nature, there's going to be a lot of people wanting to make it big, and not everyone will make it big. And like this is the thing where uh, like I'm sure you guys also know, in that like releasing an indie game in 2009 or 2012. wasn't automatically a guarantee of success so it's not like like there was this golden age where anyone could make like million bucks of their unity tutorial or something so no but i mean like this is something that i even have even heard you say that yeah. if you were releasing a game in a certain time period the competition was almost non existent that the fact that you existed would become uh would would be visible pretty soon Uh, no this was a thing where like due to certain conditions on steam like if you existed yeah. on steam during like yes. certain that kind of provided you an extra platform and like valve yes. pretty much realized that uh, that they didn't want to hold such a position of power whereas they can just like provide a golden touch to somebody and be like yes your you your like yeah, yeah. yeah they didn't want to be the guys who are sitting at a table deciding who like you know who gets on yeah uh, who gets on a sport and who drowns yeah uh, so they decided that yeah. like the steam is going to be moved towards more openness and they made made some mistakes with green light and etc etc and it, like and now they're pretty much going to make it open soon so i think this is this is good because now everyone's on an equal platform whereas earlier uh, there were people who were on steam and who and for them it was easier to get press attention youtuber attention uh, to get on like bundles etc sales opportunities it was it like everything was easier and for for a large number of people uh, like the same opportunities were, were just not available like no bundle like the bigger bundles wouldn't accept games who were not on steam and youtubers wouldn't review games unless they were on steam and the press in general would be more uh like would be more reluctant to review games so i think this is this is a great leveler and it's natural that like the people who have had it easy like once like the the thing is removed from them like they they kind of there is a period of kicking and screaming where they are like <laughs> yeah well, it's not exactly kicking and screaming from jeff vogel's part like that article is not kicking and screaming that is him being resigned and saying everything is going to go to hell now uh the, like he basically the, i think the title of the article is the indie bubble is about to burst and uh, it is a very uh, you know this used to be a nice neighborhood kind of article <laughs> yeah. if you get no, my, I, nay, my feeling one thing which i don't uh, get is that whoever is saying that there are too many games why don't they just stop making them like oh we are following that other guy who wrote a response he uh I forgot his name but he pretty much said the same It's yeah no block. i mean see the thing is like there is a lot of things because see jeff wojel had a big sale on his uh, personal website that was called the never on steam sale where he at that point was moaning about how steam was unfair and uh, like these uh, these 75% sales that steam has devalue games and like how everyone should be on steam but once he got on steam and when once he got like the taste of the sweet steam money his tone immediately <laughs> changed to oh my god there's too many people on steam <laughs> so yeah like th- so, and, and like this is not like, like once you get yeah and this is not once like, you get inside the gated community you don't want refraff coming in yeah uh, it's it's like that immigration debate you know where your generation of immigrants was very hard working they were the best people 
<laughs> but the next generation that's coming these are just like yeah these are the most worthless people ever like, and look at all the crime they're bringing yeah. into our beautiful love community yeah that's pretty much exactly what like what it is and like i don't want to target like this one guy in particular because there is a lot of yeah. people saying this it's not just him oh yeah, yeah. it's absolutely not just him yeah. uh, and like just to give a bit of perspective i i usually find that he writes far more measured articles than the one he just put out you know yeah uh, he's not this uh, he's not this blatantly one sided yeah i mean in no in uh, this article i guess like that's why i use the term kicking and screaming because in general his articles are more like measured and like they're like i've had some thinking about this and this is what i think but in this one like he just like it's i would say it's it's pretty close to scare mongering where he's like doom and gloom hey. everybody pack up your shops and stuff like that so yeah <laughs> i mean like the this in general like the market is definitely crowded and there's always going to be like lot of people vying for attention but like that's just how it is everywhere i mean if you if you let's say you are a band and you release a new and you make a new album today guess what there's like 5 million other bands with their own uh, like uh, with their own band camp pages with their own uh, soundcloud pages with their youtube channels with their this and like with their local gigs so i like games are moving towards that now and yeah there, there's no real way to stop this because yeah there yeah there isn't really a, a concrete way where you can stop this games are becoming more democratized it is a good thing because it will add variety to the kind of games that come out yeah. uh, it is not it is not that like games are homo- there is a homogeneity in the games industry yes that's a small problem but that's not the reason this is good this is good because this is a new generation and things are finally changing in a in a big way you know yeah. democratization of steam which allows large amount of content to come in yes yeah. there will be some churn there will it will be a bit chaotic for a while but eventually the market will settle down no, and i think and like, it will uh, what it wants to play what it wants to buy yeah. and it, i don't think it's ever going to happen that good games will will like you know someone who makes a good game is just going to be completely unknown and no one is ever going to like uh, notice them i don't think that's ever going to happen there will be a community that forms around a good game well like i guess like it depends because uh like there are like in like some like then there's lots of complicated stuff because like by, by making enough for for us is is i guess less because we live in india compared to somebody who's in like san francisco or something so and i mean like it's it's not 100% fair like i mean i i don't want to pretend that like steam is becoming some sort of you know like utopia where everything is fair and the uh, the better games get the more money and the lesser the games get the yeah. and the the high end indie indie developers will always get more exposure yeah. there's no doubt about that game yeah. made by someone like mike bithil or rami ismail will 100% get 30 to 40 times exposure that something like unres gets yeah uh, there's there's ne- there, there's no argument about that and and you know what to an extent that is fine those guys have had to work to get to that place mm-hmm. where they get that kind of exposure like you get rami ismail that guy like i mean it's it must be mentally exhausting to be him the amount of exposure he has and the amount of writing he does about everything that happens in this industry like i'm surprised his head doesn't explode yeah uh, <laughs> yeah that's definitely uh, like they, but yeah like that's i guess just uh, so i mean yeah i mean in general i think it's it's better like for because it's better. it's not perfect but yeah. it's better i mean because like the, because we aren't even like at the beginning of the problems in the indie scene like for example the like the, the paramount importance of steam like right now like games fire is shutting down what if in 10 years it comes to the point where steam is is like shutting down or something because you never know i mean at one point like ibm was like king and like you the wouldn't thing. have imagined ibm shutting down like the thing you know so yeah like yeah, that sure. so that's something that's also like on the like that's also very problematic the the sheer amount of importance that like we give to steam is is kind of like well there are yeah. there are good competitors building up around it gog is going strong in the humble store gog and the humble store i think give give them 2 to 3 years time they will become formidable competition yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I sure hope so because like right now it's just like too lopsided, like. They've got a monopoly, and which means they can do whatever they want. But I'd like to see like my my worry is also that you know when we start seeing competition and all, is it going to be competitions that they're running over who can undercut the other? Because yeah, like that generally what happens, which is then really horrible for the games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes a race to the bottom where everyone decides. All right, uh, five dollars, three dollars, four dollars, two dollar. Okay, ninety nine cents. That's where if it ends up there, yeah. dude, then that's not good. Look at what Origin is doing. Origin is like on the house offer. Here's a game for free. You know that's. You know, but you know, okay, fine, fine, fine. Like the on the house offer that you're talking about, right? Yeah, where, it's an uh, entirely Battle different was thing. But it was for a weekend or something. It was not free forever. Yeah, no, but like it's just saying that you know. That's what Steam does that as well. Yeah. Steam has free weekends for games. Yeah, no, but like uh, the, the game expires once you like once the free weekend is over. Not the same thing on Origin. That game will expire. No, it doesn't. Free... No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. That is a like I redeemed uh, like Populous Battlefield 1942, and they are still in my Origin account. Yeah, they're it's, giving it, it away it, literally for free. Yeah. So Battlefield, if I get it now, it's mine. Yeah. yeah. Get on Origin. You won't get man. the That's like. Yeah, yeah, they want like you, you to like make an origin account and download this thing and like the the multitudes of DLC hey, isn't free. Yeah, that Dragon so, Age Inquisition, I am in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I mean, okay, fine. Like, I mean, look at the game that they're putting out for free. I guess so it's Battlefield Three. It's the it's not even the latest iteration of, yeah. iteration of the Battlefield. Yeah, I mean, they like yeah, they won't put, do that. I mean, this is after all EA uh, quote unquote he... like sales cheap and intellectual property. So. <laughs> So yeah, like they won't cheapen uh, their intellectual property by like releasing it on free. They won't cheapen their latest intellectual yeah. property. They <laughs> cheap the last iteration of their intellectual yeah. property by by putting it out. <laughs> so no, they, that your concern is that it will become a rat race to the bottom. Yeah, and the thing is, like when they just says this rat race thing, the key thing to remember is that the people who actually are affected is the developers, not as much as the people who are doing the rat race thing. Yeah, because guess like what? That, like that's yeah. my worry is that you know the developers yeah. are gonna be the ones who lose out in this. Yeah. I like see. I don't. I don't think that will happen. I I'll tell you why. Because uh, you look at our audience. Like the P the the gaming audience on PC is not the gaming audience on mobile. See, that's his point of reference. When like I think even Bogle makes this claim that we're going to end up in an iTunes app to app store situation where everyone is trying to go free to play or everyone is trying to undercut the other in terms of price. Right? Yeah. Pretty uh, much. Yeah. And and the counter argument to that is we have a much more educated audience. And yes, our audience is looking out for a deal as well, and they do a lot of purchase purchases during sale time. But they understand the value of our product. Like they understand the value of what we're making, and they understand that why it costs more is because the amount of work that goes into it and the kind of quality that on average that's being like we're aiming for something more ambitious generally. Yes, it's a very snooty fucking thing to say, uh, but it's true. Like the the audience on PC is more educated, and they want more from their games, so they're willing to pay more for their games. Uh, Do you agree or disagree, Tejas? I, I I agree to some extent, but I think we might be like you know overestimating it because you can't just say oh yeah they're more educated because there's it's yeah, a I mean wide, I would say it's a like very wide uh, variety of gamers that we have there's like yeah. tons of different people with tons of different you know points of views there are people who will only buy one or two games a year which are these triple A games and they're they're good there are other people like us who will be like no we we need something new we're really looking for a great uh, experience but that's not everybody there are people who play games because they like the story so you know screw what the mechanics are or the gameplay but if i like enjoy the story it works for me you know like so there is a wide array and there are different ways you can cater to people and so yeah maybe it's not going to be entirely app store like which that you know it, it's a whole different market in uh entirely no, it's, it's not just a whole it's not just a whole different market it is a completely green market a lot of the people who are buying games on the app store have never played games before in their life they're not used to playing no, but see i don't think we can say that anymore either it's like the, the app store has been running for quite a while they have yeah, 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 but, games, but, but wait, 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 the you... majority the majority of this audience like i'm see, the, the majority of this audience they not not have... it's not that they've, they've been playing mobile games sure they've been playing mobile games but mobile games is all they know exactly that's my point the majority it? of that audience mobile games is all they know the pc gaming audience 
on average is more educated uh, see i i th- that's the that's the thing like we can't say they're more educated it's a different type of education we have uh the pc audience who's been educated off let's say you know going back to the core so they've been going off of mario or halo if it's the newer generation so they, that's their point of reference you ask a kid who whose first game was halo 1 like the first halo you know what he thought of like older games he wouldn't know in the same way in the the people who have been playing mobile and only mobile that's all they know and that's their platform yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but because the people who are playing mobile and only mobile that's all they know the big difference is the barometer of how they value a game in terms of money is is completely fucking skewed they don't value games it is not something they are a, a large number of them it is not something they're willing to pay money for it is something they waste time on while riding the bus or riding a train that is different from the experience that pc gamers have they come to a pc game prepared to invest time into it that is the big thing and because they're willing to put their time into it they're willing to shell out money for an experience that does that the mobile gamer who's play, been playing mobile games for the last 5 to 10 years is thinking of this as a time sink something they do to waste time on a bus ride or while sitting around like you know chatting like just before you meet your friends while you're waiting for your friends in a cafe or something they take this out and they play it for a while so that the time that's going to be wasted they have something to do in between that is the difference there is no value on that experience for the guys in the mobile community there is a big value placed on this experience for people playing games on pc which is why they will pay money for that experience because there is a value add there to it. is but when you, okay consider this that with, with newer generations coming up the first thing that they have access to is a, is a mobile phone right so that's that's the first thing that they're going to start playing on so that mentality of i am you know i play a game and i you know it's something i'll you know yeah that i'm entitled to a free game and if i want to pay for it maybe i will maybe i won't that's for the game to you know really prove to me that i should pay for it right that is something that then these gamers who may have started on mobile as kids and i'm talking young kids when they if they ever move on to like another platform that's the mentality that they'll have and you know over time like this is not something that's going to happen you know in the next few years but maybe after a decade that is the prevalent mentality that a lot of gamers will have you know i don't think so i don't think so because again But like no, you look at this it's, generation it's quite possible like like think about the number of kids who are playing games off of a mobile sure they're playing games off of mobile but then for them they can uh, what is like a large number of those kids because they're freaking yeah, like see the 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 audience that i am talking about when i say a large audience i'm not talking about the kids kids will eventually be able to distinguish between an experience they do to waste time and an experience they invest time in and here's the difference between the uh, here's the big difference between both those things a lot of kids are not going to have half an hour long conversations about how fucking cool candy crush is but they will have a, a discussion about how cool diablo 3 is or how cool minecraft is a majority of the young generation in the us by the way even though there is a shitload of tablets and stuff there most of them would rather play minecraft There's a shitload of kids playing Minecraft right now. That is a paid experience and they're willing to sink a lot of time into it. And so I think the kind of experience we'll see for the next generation will be more stuff like Minecraft and Spelunky experiences they can keep coming back to. That that add value that way. Stuff like Daisy. That is going to be the experience that that generation is going to value. That's what I think. Now, what what you're talking about what I was talking about specifically are people who are in their 20s and 30s who have never played games in their life. That is the large segment of the mobile gaming audience. Yeah. Boy, why? It's the large. It's not kids. This is not like yes, part of it is being explicitly marketed to kids because people want to monetize teens. I mean, I think that this GDC this year taught us that that mm. monetizing teens is high on the agenda of <laughs> mobile game makers. But uh, the 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 big market, the whales, and like the the twenty to thirty up and coming people who are who are into this, they've never played games in their life, and this is the first thing they've experienced. and that's why they don't value it a child can learn the difference between you know okay this is cool because all my friends are talking about it and this is something i do which is just it's time pass it's something i waste time on it's not something we sit down and discuss my mom loves candy crush but she's not going to sit down and have a conversation with her friends about candy crush you know kids will not sit down and have a conversation about that mobile game they're playing to pass time but they will sit down and have a conversation about dragon age or they will sit down and have a conversation about half life or whatever the fuck the next big evolve whatever the fuck the next big thing is 
uh and like may maybe conversations about these mobile games will start happening once you get more developers like simugo on the stage i don't know uh, like i would say like that this is probably like too much of a, like what will happen 10 years 20 years in the future yeah but but like i think like i would like whatever we were saying about like pc audience more educated etc i want this to be true but in my <laughs> like i don't think it's 100% true so uh, like i don't know like just like too many variables to consider what i think is that like there's probably too much like uh, like you know over the top hysteria kind of thing going on where everyone is rushing to one extreme so jeff wojel is like all games be dead and some people are like utopia for all games starting uh, 2015 or something I, so i i don't think it's going to be a utopia it will be like i said it's going to be chaotic for a while where everybody figures out what their place is but i don't think it's the doom and gloom scenario that is being predicted yeah they, like the market will stabilize eventually and people will figure out how to sell games in it yeah. i don't think it's going to end up in a rat race to the bottom there will be problems because the number of developers have grown but there will be good things because the number of developers have grown as well mm-hmm. and the uh, and the thing that uh, i think jeff fogel has neglected to say in a big way is that the audience has grown as well the audience hasn't stayed static in this time it has grown Anyway, I'm done. I've I've talked for too long. Someone else talks. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I I don't know because uh yeah, there's just too much uh, variables to like for me to know. Like and yeah, I mean, it's not like you can like if I knew exactly what was happening in the future, I wouldn't be telling it on this podcast that nobody listens to. I would be like exploiting <laughs> it and like making more money for myself so I can buy that island. But yeah, so I I don't know what's going to happen. But yeah, like I think. like ultimately i think for a lot of people it's just this sh- the realization that this is actually an entertainment business and the f- chances of failure are super high is like is is frightening for people who genuinely believe that they got their like who like genuinely couldn't see how things went for them like how they were very fortunate and then suddenly something happens which like some of that fortune is uh, moving to some, some other people and they are like oh my god they're they're bringing the refraff in this is going to be hard So yeah, like I don't know, like things will sort themselves out eventually. Like yeah, but we still are headed towards a change in the way games, or at least that's what I believe, is that there's going to be a massive change in just the type of games that are focused on uh compared to But I mean that happens every generation. Yeah, right? yeah that's true. Like I mean all yeah. of a sudden rogue like that. Xbox person shooter ruled ruled this last generation and It looks like this coming generation is going to be ruled by oh, like, procedural, like I don't know, procedural kind of games that are open world kind of. You know? I mean, on an optimistic note, I'd say probably this generation is the most uh, open to like not having one genre to rule them all. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, I I think that's what's going to happen. Like, no, it's not going to be like the one this thing or something. Like, I think this generation will have a lot more variety because there's a lot of like independent developers now a lot of people who can make like high quality stuff like transistor which looks better than any triple a game i've ever played <laughs> so i mean and, and yeah and these are people who have either left triple a studios or so like these people know how to make that same experience and these people also have a lot of money like i'm not saying transistor was made out of like hopes and dreams so Yeah, it was made with uh, a, like a pretty decent chunk of yeah. money probably. So yeah, like I think this this generation is going to be like uh, like hopefully like I want to I want this to happen that uh, just like lots of uh, different types of games coming out and there's not this one uh, like game design template that whatever you want to make you want to make a Star Wars game just uh, like smash that uh, Star Wars thing on this template and you'll have this game something like that. Like I think this this time we I hope to see a lot more variation in general. Huh? Yeah, that sounds kind of cool. Yeah. Like the the same the same hope I I hope to see more variety. Like that's that's always good for an industry because diversification is the is one thing that will not let us down. Uh, you know, mm. it, like we might see new genres will can lead to a new audience. coming in that i wasn't in here before uh which is a good thing mm-hmm. but on that <laughs> note <laughs> i think we should uh call this podcast uh quits what say guys yep yep 
Alrighty. Well, everybody who's listening, all two of you, good night. Have a great day. Whatever time it is at your end. This is Tejas signing out. This is Arvind and Vivek.